It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. These are the final seconds. The lead in the fourth. Can they hold on to it? That do or die time. And everything rides on one shot. But it isn't going to be that easy. This is down to the wire. One shot to take you to the top. One win. This is clutch basketball. That's the NBA playoffs. That's game. Today's episode of Locked On Blackhawks is brought to you by Locked On NHL. If you need more hockey news every day, then Locked On NHL is here to fill the gap. It's our daily podcast on everything happening in the league. Subscribe and listen each day for a quick look at the biggest stories in game recaps on Locked On NHL. Your Locked On Blackhawks, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Today is Tuesday, June 29th. I'm your host, Jack Bushman. You can find me out on Twitter at JackBushman2, or you can also check out my Strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey for all the latest Blackhawks news and updates. If you like what you're hearing today, then please be sure to go and follow the podcast. You can leave me a review if you want to as well. It's all free wherever you may listen to your podcast, whether that be through Apple Podcasts, Odyssey, Spotify, etc. And you'll be able to get the latest episode as soon as it comes out each day. Also, if you're on Twitter, then please go follow the Locked On Blackhawks Twitter page. That can be found at capital L, capital O, underscore Blackhawks, with some really good content being posted there every day as well. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you for tuning into another episode of Locked On Blackhawks. Joining me on the show here today is a guest you're probably getting uh, quite familiar with as last week. I dropped a two-part interview with Jay Forster, the host of Lockdown Blue Jackets, to discuss all the details uh, with Seth Jones and whether or not the Blackhawks should pursue him this summer to try and take over as their number one defenseman of the future. But Jay's joining me for a little bit more of a serious topic this afternoon. We're going to be discussing uh, the Blackhawks lawsuit that they are currently facing and uh, all the disgusting details that have come out about that. Um, but Jay, I really do appreciate you uh, offering to come on this podcast and talk with me about this tough subject, because uh, as I told my listeners in today's episode, it's just kind of a tough thing to talk yourself about for 30 minutes, you know? Oh yeah, for sure. And I think we, we talked about this before, but like, it's, I, it's something that I wanted to address and it's something that obviously um, the, the 2015 uh, Kane accusations were really what kind of pushed me out of being a Blackhawks fan not specifically because you know whether he did it or he didn't I think that's that's you know we're never going to know but the way the organization handled it was what really soured me on on the team and so I am uh completely unsurprised that they are also handling this badly um but yeah it's something that I wanted to talk about and so when I saw that you were going to talk about I thought I'll reach out and see if you want to have a conversation because having a conversation about this is way easier than just kind of, like you say, talking to yourself for for 20 minutes about it. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I think that's one thing that that's not the most disappointing about this situation. I mean, there's so many things that are disappointing, but one thing that that really hurts is just the Blackhawks. It's uh, when this first, when this report first came out, I obviously I was surprised by the news, but I wasn't surprised that the Blackhawks were involved in something like this. And it happened in the NHL because unfortunately, as we know, the NHL's it's hopefully gotten a little bit better um, due to uh, multiple stories coming out in the past year or so. We've seen a bunch of changes in the NHL, particularly to the coaching staffs. And um, we just know that hockey unfortunately had this bad culture and the Blackhawks, this isn't their first incident where they've kind of handled a situation like this very poorly. So, yeah, we'll definitely dive into all of that. But um, I figured I might as well just kind of start with the timeline of events here that all came out. So it was back in, uh, I believe it was May 12th, WBEZ, uh, Dave McKinney came out with a report. It was the initial report that stated that a former player from the 2010 championship Blackhawks team is suing the organization over 
allegations of harassment and sexual assault by a former assistant coach, which we now know to be former video coach Brad Aldrich, and really the organization, um, the, the incident, the first report stated that the team was made aware of the incidents and they really did nothing about it. And we didn't really know all the details at this point. It was just the report. And now over the past couple of weeks, it's like bomb after bomb after bomb making uh, the situation. So it's good. It's coming to light, but oh man, what a, a nightmare of a situation the Blackhawks have created for themselves. Not only did they um, not file a police report, but they threatened the player, not them, but the coach threatened the player financially and physically with his playing time. If he didn't engage in these, um, in these acts, I'm not going to go into detail about all of those. If you want to go look at the report, WBEZ is where you can find it. But basically what's come out over the past couple of weeks, Jay, is that not only did the coaching or the front office know about this incident and did not re- file police report. Of course, Brad Aldrich then went on to become a, um, he sexually abused a 16 year old in Michigan a couple of years later. And the school that hired him had no clue about his prior acts. And not only did the whole front office know about it, but now we know the team knew about it as well. Um, it's just a whole mess of a situation. And I don't know if you, I, the tough part about the play, like coming out that the players knew it, I don't think you really like, it's such a tough situation for a player to be in. I, I guess this is the first kind of, point we could talk about there's a bunch of spots we'll jump around to jay but what is your stance on like here hearing that the players knew about this yeah i think that was that was like the the gut punch for me you know and i want to say that I, I like i don't think that it was the players were involved in some kind of massive cover-up conspiracy right. um but and there was a um there was a really interesting point on the most recent Steve Dangle podcast, actually, where they talked about, you know, these comments that are coming out of like, well, they're professional athletes. They could have just overpowered this guy. So clearly, you know, it, it's not it, either. It didn't happen or they were, you know, quote unquote, asking for it or just, you know, a load of really kind of gross victim blaming right. that's going on. And I think the NHL is built on a culture of don't rock the boat. Don't make a fuss don't speak out about this kind of thing. And it's, again, yeah, I think I'm, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not surprised. I think that the play is new, but it is that kind of that gut punch of, oh, literally everyone knew. I think there was a, um, Daniel Carcillo tweeted mm-hmm. a couple of days ago. He'd been, he was playing for the Flyers at that time. Um, and the time that this all happened was the, um, the Stanley Cup, I think it was the third round of the yes. playoffs. Yes, the player, the players, the report that came out was that the players knew about this when they were flying to San Jose for the conference finals after beating Vancouver in the second round. Yes, so they beat. Um, so they they won the third round, and then Daniel Carcillo played for the Flyers. So obviously they played, they played in the final, and he he tweeted saying that he knew about it. Yes, he you knew know, about so it. you play players on other teams knew about it, and it feels very. Um, it's just deeply, deeply upsetting to know that this is something that people have been sitting on for so long. Yeah, and uh, Blackhawks 2010 defenseman Brent Sopel and Nick Boynton both confirmed that they were aware of the situation as well. They were both members of the 2010 Stanley Cup team. Um, it's, in, it's, it, I had a situation this weekend where We'll get into the the media coverage of this, or I guess the lack of media coverage so far. Um, but I was with one of my buddies over the weekend, and he's a hockey fan. He had, and he's on social media, all social media platforms: Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, you name it. He's on it. He had no idea about the situation. One and two, the thing that he said, he's like, if I was a professional athlete, I would I would just punch this guy in the face. And I'm like. Not every not everyone thinks like that though, and also it's so easy to say, but you're not in that situation where, you know, your ice time could be affected, your career could be affected. They were threatening them financially as well. Like it's just such a messed up situation where, who knows what? It's easy to say from afar what you would have done, but in that situation, like especially, imagine being a kid dreaming of getting to the NHL your whole life, and you get there, and this is this is what you find out it is. That's yeah. 
Exactly. Such a disaster. And it's like we we don't know anything about the the two players. Um, they've I don't even believe they're named in the in the lawsuit. That no, they're, like the, the guy the guy in the lawsuit is John Doe. So we have no idea which players it could be. Whether it was veterans, rookies, star players, like guys that are struggling to make the team. You know, if and if you're some 18 year old 19 year old kid who's it's his first season he's just trying to he's, you know he m- maybe is not even playing he's uh, he's a black ace he's trying to make the team and you get the video coach coming over and you know saying i can get more ice time if this happens or if you tell anyone then your career is over you know and i think it, it is really easy to be like well i would punch that guy in the face if i was you know you know, most hockey players are what six foot, two hundred pounds plus. Like right. it's, it's so easy to be like, yeah, he could have physically overpowered him. But like, in these kind of situations, like physical strength doesn't. I mean, it's it counts for nothing. You know, it is it is all psychological and emotional um, power that he had over these guys. You know, and it's. Um, I was talking to. Um, uh, uh, an athletic trainer for a completely, a completely unrelated purpose. Um, I was just talking to her about it and she was talking about, you know, coaches, physiotherapists, they're supposed to be a safe place for a player to go. If they're having problems with another coach or they're having problems with someone on their team, you should be able to go to anyone on that team who is in a position of power and trust them. You know, this guy was someone that they should have been able to trust. This guy was someone that maybe they did trust. And it, it is it is so hard when someone's in a position of power like that. Like, it's, he's not like their boss boss, you know. It's not like the head coach was telling them to do this kind of thing. But if you give someone the title coach, it gives them power over over the player, you know. So it's it's so easy to sit here and be like, well, yeah, they should have. They should have just overpowered him and, and punched him in the face or whatever. But it's like it's no nowhere near. No. That simple. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this tough conversation with Jay Forster from Lockdown Blue Jackets will continue in just a moment. But first, I need to talk to you all about RockAuto.com. Rock Auto is a family business that's been serving auto parts customers online for over 20 years. Go to rockauto.com to shop for auto and body parts from hundreds of different manufacturers. Why would you choose to spend 30%, 50%, or even as much as 100% more for the exact same auto parts at a chain store or at a new car dealership? Chain stores and car dealerships have different price tiers for professional mechanics and do-it-yourselfers, but rockauto.com's prices are the same for everybody and they're always reliably low. The rockauto.com catalog is also remarkably unique and super easy to navigate. You can quickly see all the parts available for your vehicle and you can even choose the brands, specifications, and the prices that you prefer. Best of all, prices at rockauto.com are always reliably low and the same for professionals and do-it-yourselfers. So why spend up to twice as much for the same parts when you can go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts that you'll ever need for your car or truck for the best possible prices. Support for this podcast comes from Invent Together. According to studies, less than 13% of all inventors who hold a U.S. patent are women. Black and Hispanic college graduates patent at half the rate of their white counterparts. But we can fix that by increasing participation in innovation and patenting by underrepresented groups. It would quadruple the number of American inventors and increase annual GDP by almost $1 trillion. Invent Together is a coalition of organizations, companies, universities, and concerned citizens committed to ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to invent and patent. Because the more diverse the American patent system gets, the stronger and more successful our nation will become. What can you do to help diverse inventors patent and unleash economic opportunity? Find out at inventtogether.org. Learn more and take action today. Exactly. And even rewind to 2010, no one, this league was even more hush hush than it was now. Like no one was coming out and I'm sure no one wanted to be that guy, you know, no one wanted to 
shine the light on this. It, it was, it's such a hard topic to talk about that it's just coming out now 10 years after it happened, you know? So, yeah, exactly. and so I, I just personally, I know the players were aware of it, but I just don't really think it hurts that they all knew and it hurts that nothing got said, but it's just such a tough position for them to sit in. And I, I don't really place blame on them. I, I really do. I mean, how could you not? This organization, how can you not handle this? <laughs> like, I, it's so bad how they handled this, just trying to cover it up. And everyone that was there in 2010 is still there. And not only is Stan Bowman the general manager of the Blackhawks, he's supposed to be general manager of Team USA. That cannot happen. Absolutely cannot happen. I know the NHL hasn't really done anything about this. The Blackhawks today finally just hired their own a kind of investigator to look in the matter. We'll get into that later as well, but that's too late. I mean, it's not even yeah, close to is good enough. It's not 10 even years too late enough. at this point. And like the assistant GM, Kevin Cheveldayoff, who is the GM of the Winnipeg Jets, the director of player development, Marta Bergevin, whose team is starting to, is starting their, their Stanley Cup final uh, games tonight. You know, and it's it's it goes so much deeper than, um, and I think it's really easy to see the Black Hawks as an organization where this kind of thing happens, because obviously, you know, the way that they handled the Kane situation was just her, like atrocious from from start to finish. And I think it's very easy to be like, well, of course, of course, this happened in the Black Hawks organization. I think it's very easy to kind of paint them as a kind of organization where this happens. But like, this is this is a league wide issue. Hundred you know? percent. Gary Bettman is refusing to comment on it. Um, Bill Daly, I think the most we got out of Bill Daly was that they knew it. They, they, they'd seen the allegation. They were not opening an investigation at this point, which I'm like, okay, listen, you can, I don't know. It's the whole thing just makes me um, just really angry and just like really sad because this sport is, so like I love this sport so much um and I've been talking about this a lot um recently because I've been doing a bunch of stuff for Pride Month and you know sport is supposed to be a safe place but it's not for queer athletes you know and it, it's it's a similar ish situation here where sports are supposed to be a safe space and then you go into this safe space and you just like it turns your life upside down like th these two players I, I don't think are in the NHL anymore um, but I, I wonder how much this incident shaped their careers after, after that cup run, up to, after that cup run, you know, it's, I mean, you could only imagine how could you come back from that? Yeah, exactly. You're, you're, and then to, to, to add to that, you know, the fact that they, they then went to someone about it, you know, and it's, if you're a, a someone who has been, you know, sexually assaulted, um, it is so hard to get past like the shame and the stigma and tell someone they told someone and then that person took it up the ladder and then I believe it turned out that so it was Paul Vincent one of the assistant coaches they went to and then they took that to um Stan Bowman and uh, a couple of other people and I believe the team sports therapist or the the uh, team psychologist or something yeah. And yep. he basically was like, so I think what basically happened was they said, okay, well, we're not going to go to the cops about this. And then I think it's come out since then as well, that the, the team therapist or whatever turned around to the players and said, well, this is your fault. You did this. Yeah. You know? So like, yeah, I, how do you, how do you get up and go to work the next day knowing that these are the kind of people that, that you're working with and this is the, the environment that, that you're in? And also, how can, how can those team officials look themselves in the mirror day in and day out thinking that they, they did right in this situation? Just continuing on like it's no big deal. It was your fault. What? Yeah. That's so messed I, up on so I many don't different know levels. How, I don't know how Stan Bowman sleeps at night. I genuinely don't. The like, whole front office has to go. Like, there's, everyone's calling for it. it. It has to happen. It has to happen. If if Stan Bowman still has his job by the by the start of next season, it's it's a travesty. And um, you, you've got to look at everyone. You've got to look at Shevelday. You've got to look at Bergman. You've got to look at Quenville. You know, 
all of these people were like, well, we weren't in the meeting. We had no idea. Like, and, you know, excuse the language, but bullshit. Yeah. It is. There is no way that these people did not know what was going on. Players on the other team knew what was going on. And you're telling me the department, the, the director of player development and the head coach didn't know what was going on. Yeah, nah. Mark, Mark, Ber- like, Mark, Bergevin, Mark Bergevin's full of shit. 100%. Yeah. If Daniel Carcillo he's, knew, so he's, Mark he's... Bergevin knew. Go ahead. I was just saying, if that was, that was all I was going to say. If Daniel Carcillo on the Philadelphia Flyers knew about this incident, you bet, you bet Mark Bergevin knew. And if he didn't know, then he was bad at his job. Right. Like, how, how, do you, care. how do you, how are you the, the person involved that heavily with the players? And you don't know that this is happening when the entire front office knows, all of the players know, you know? And I get that his job was mostly to do with like scouting and prospects. And he probably wasn't super heavily involved in like the day to day running of the team. But I am absolutely, I am not buying that he knew no. nothing about it at all. Like, no. Not at all. And one thing I did want to go back to knowing what we do now, knowing that the whole team knew, the front office knew. The Blackhawks' first response to when the statement came out by WBEZ, and I quote: "The team said it regards sexual has- yeah. The team said it regards sexual harassment as an important issue, but questioned the legitimately the legitimacy of the lawsuit." That was their first response to this. No yeah, one it, and they are immediately trying to save face, and I think that they're trying to get the the lawsuit thrown out because of um, statute of limitations. I'm not, I'm not super. Yeah, I'm not super up on like the American law system, but I believe it's past the statute of limitations for this this kind of thing. But yeah, like, how do you? How is your first response to this? We we don't believe you. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like this. It's just turning into. It, it was seriously for like a week. Every morning I woke up, I'm like, how, do, how is this still getting worse? And it's every, somehow- every single, every single day, I feel like it gets worse and worse and worse. The more I hear about it and it feels like the, it feels like the team just is saving their own skin. You know, I, and again, like, I, I know I keep going back to the, the cave thing and I want to talk about that in a little yes. bit of detail. Um, in a minute but the thing that really bothered me when all of the the Patrick Kane stuff came out in in the summer of 2015 is at no point did the Black Hawks release any kind of statement saying we treat these we treat accusations of sexual harassment and rape seriously we do not condone these we are looking into it every single statement from them in 2015 was we will support our our player we will support our teammate you know, and that's like, yeah, I get it. I get that you, you don't want to throw him to the wolves, but also I feel like you can say that you're supporting your teammate and also make it clear that these are serious allegations and you're taking them seriously as opposed to just kind of brushing them off. Um, oh. And it, it looks like they, they have not learned from that because they're kind of doing exactly the same thing here, which is these kind of fake, we're looking into it and we we don't condone sexual harassment statements that mean nothing. No, I mean, you can tell they, they it's almost like they don't care. And yeah. that's, that's the disappointing part that really makes me one of the biggest diehard Blackhawks fans that I know. If Stan Bowman has a, has a job next October, I'm, I'm not going to go to a game. You're not going to catch me at a game. Uh, I'm going to still cover the team because it's my job, but it makes – it's so disappointing that it makes me not even want to root for them anymore. It's like, how can you guys think this is okay? What example are you setting here? Like, it's just so disappointing yeah. that the Blackhawks time in and time out don't seem like they get the memo. Like they only want to save face and they only care about how they're involved, like through their players and whatnot. They don't get the bigger picture here. And that's the disappointing part to me. And you can talk about your Kane stuff if you want to going on now. I think we're at a good point talking about how the, the organization continues to drop the ball in handling situations. It's also happened with the Blackhawks and uh, their logo and the headdresses. I know that's a completely different conversation, but the way they handled it was not even close to the best. No, it's just, yeah, the, the again, and I don't want to get I dragged off into a, a, a debate about the logo because I could go for, I could talk for days right. about 
the, the Black Hawk logo and why that's why it's bad. But, you know, when they're making when they're making statements about, you know, we skate for black lives or whatever, the, the we skate for everyone or hockey's for everyone. And they're also plastering that logo all over it. Like, it just feels so disingenuous. Um, and again, similarly, like, I don't. When when they when they release these st- this statement like we we uh, we treat sexual harassment accusations very seriously, I'm mm-hmm. like, do you? Because this is this is this in in ten years this is probably this is the biggest story in hockey this year. This should be the most important story in sports. You know, this is a decade long cover up and. And yeah, it's I, like I I don't know how anyone could have looked at how they handled 2015 and thought the Blackhawks were going to do the right thing here, um, because and again like that's that's the 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 kicker for me is is not that it happened necessarily you know like it is awful and horrifying and bad that it happened in 2010. It is worse that they covered it up then, and it is even worse that now they are trying to cover it up and just wait for it all to blow over instead of saying we we did the wrong thing we apologize we're gonna make amends you are a billion dollar organization how are you how are you sitting here trying to pretend like you've never done anything wrong in your life like you're one of the most recognizable brands in north american sports it it baffles me like i don't surely you would want to come down hard on this and, and make make a a, 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 a good example uh, I guess is is the is the word I'm looking for like how do you not want to make come out with a strong statement and say we don't condone this we are investigating it will be dealt with like how do you how do you see this unfolding and think that the no commenting and the um the hiring of the same independent investigator that was involved in the um, Larry Nassar accusations. Like, how can you look at what the Blackhawks are doing, like, as a member of the Blackhawks organization and, like, I guess pat yourself on the back for a, for a job well done? Like, I don't understand how you can, you can look at what's happened over the past two weeks and think that you have done a good job in handling this. Right. It's like they don't understand that their actions speak louder than their words, whatever their words are going to be, the actions are going to speak for it. That's not going to be, we're not going to believe some statement where you say we uh, hockey's for everyone when this is what you're doing behind closed doors and how you really act when you think not the the whole world's not watching. This is what you're doing behind closed doors. And one thing that kind of stands out to me when you bring it up, when you're like, how are you not trying to set a good example for the league and clearly this situation is a nightmare what good is going to come out of this what good if you're um if you're stan bowman what do you think is going to happen here you really think you're going to still have a job in a couple months and it it almost scares me that this is the way they're going about it because i wonder if these like high-ranking officials in the blackhawks organization i wonder if they think that if they just go about things this way the league being the way it is like, you know, these people continuously get hired. Mike Babcock got hired by NBC sports, which is an absolute joke. These people continue to get hired in this industry, maybe not as a head coaching gig, but Mike Babcock is still talking about hockey on Wednesday night rivalries. I'm like, are you kidding me? It makes me. So wonder- yeah, Mike, Mike Babcock was, he basically like emotionally manipulated his younger players on the Leafs. And yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to use like the word bullying or anything, but he basically like, and then he got hired by a Canadian university to to coach teenagers. You know, it's it it, uh, and then yeah, like NBC, like people still, if if Stan Bowman got fired tomorrow, he would have a job before the week is out, and that's because just- that's how this that's how this league works. If you're good at your job, and I mean, we can we can debate all day about how good Stan Bowman actually is, at <laughs> job, you know, but if, if you're good at your job, then it doesn't matter what you're like off the ice. Right. You know? And that's, um, what's, making, that's like, what's making look me at, think. Look at Slava Voinov. Contract terminated by the Kings. 
went back to the KHL, is making a bucket load of money. Yeah. Um, Mike Ribeiro, who the Preds protected and supported right up until he wasn't as good on the ice anymore. And then very suddenly he got shipped off to the minors. They didn't really want anything to do with him. If you're good in this league, then you can get away with literally murder. You know, it's it. Ugh. That's the, that's the toxicity of this league, sadly, and that's it's, what... yeah. And it's 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 the culture. Like this is not a. And again, I said it at the, at the top of the recording. This is not a Black Hawks problem. No, I don't even think this is an NHL problem. This is from the top down. This this league, this sport, is broken. All right, ladies and gentlemen, my chat with Jay Forster will continue in just a moment. But first, I need to talk to you all about betonline.ag, your online sportsbook experts. And be sure to use our promo code LOCKDOWN, one word in all caps, to receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. Major League Baseball is getting into the summer swing. The NBA and NHL playoffs are getting towards the second round. UFC is an all-year-round sport, and you can get all the latest news, odds, and info with Bet Online. They have real-time updated odds and props on almost anything you can imagine. It's seriously the best way to place your bets, and it's also free to sign up. So don't sit on the sidelines anymore. Head on over to the website, or you can also use your mobile device to sign up today. And be sure to use our exclusive promo code LOCKDOWN, that's one word in all caps, to receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. You got, this is kids are learning this kind of stuff at 14 um i saw a, a spreadsheet going around on twitter a couple of days ago that basically details um every nhl player that has been accused or charged with uh, some kind of sexual assault sexual harassment or um rape and it is it just the list goes on and on and on and it starts with 16 year olds in the OHL who were harassing girls at high school or they're getting a little bit older and you know they're raping these girls and getting away with it it starts at the very very bottom and it goes all the way up to the top like you you can't you can't redeem that like it's it just it, it it's getting to the point where I'm like we we just need to stop stop the sport and start from the beginning you know it's almost well yeah exactly it's like how do you fix what you guys have created we're we're hearing these nightmare stories come out about what's happening to like you just said 16 year olds in the ohl it's starting that early that's how broken the system is in hockey yeah. you're absolutely right and like the 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 it was i want to say it was the sioux greyhounds it was it was three 16 year olds or 17 year olds one of them was nick cousins who has since gone on to play in the nhl and two other guys whose names I can't remember. The GM of the Sioux Greyhounds at that time, Kyle Dubas, who yeah. is now the GM of the Toronto Maple Leafs, and who basically came out and did the whole, oh, well, you know, boys will be boys, but I'm sure they're sorry. Um, I believe their punishment for, for that whole thing was that they had to do like ten hour, a 10-hour course in why sexual harassment is bad. Yeah. It, you it know, just, it's, it just it just shows it's that broken. In, in this system league, is broken. <laughs> in this, yeah, in this league, if you know somebody or you're good at your job, you're gonna find another one. And that's why I'm thinking like the Blackhawks and these front office officials who are going about this, they're thinking that okay, well, if we salvage what we can, we'll still be all right. We'll still have a job somewhere in this industry. Maybe not this high up, but we'll be all right. Look at what happened to Mike Babcock. Look at what happened to all these other guys who have been involved with similar situations, and they're still out here having hockey careers one way or another. And that's the disgusting part to me is that it, yeah. they, they think they're going to be okay. I mean, one of the, I'm sorry, I'm just going to Google, Google his name. So I make sure I get the right guy. Um, 
I want to say uh, Brett Hull, Black oh, Hawks yeah. ambassador. Mm-hmm. Has Bobby, been, Hall. Bobby Hall. That's the one. Yeah. Um, Made some uh, real, he said uh, Hitler had some good ideas. Repeatedly beaten multiple wives. Yeah, he also said Hitler. He's a Black Hawks ambassador. Yeah. There's a friggin' statue of him outside the United Center. Like. Are we surprised that the Black Hawks act like this? It is, yeah. It is It is written into the DNA of the team. It is written into the DNA of the league. It is, the system is set up to support abusers and uh, people who exploit other people and it is set up to fail everyone else like and again like the the nhl pa i genuinely don't know what the nhl pa does apart from like um so it, it came out that the one of the players i believe went to someone at the nhl pa yeah, to, they... to talk about this mm-hmm. and the nhl pa was like well that's between you and the team essentially right. i'm like then what are you even for what is even your job apart from reducing tom wilson's suspensions like <laughs> And, and it, it comes out that, you know, like players that struggle with addiction or um, if they are, if they suffer career ending injuries, they, you know, these guys, they leave home at 14. They, some of them don't graduate high school, you know, like, and then suddenly they're 28. They haven't got a job. Like, what, what do they do? The NHLPA doesn't help those guys, but wow. the NHLPA is over here protecting the people in power because if they protect the people in power then they can protect their own reputation exactly. and that's what it is this this is a reputation game sadly and yeah. I, I think we're in agreement that the blackhawks all front office has to go guy clean house it's got every, yeah, every single one of them like every single one has to go and you you talk to everyone i know that they asked nick Leddy about this um in in the the islanders like end of season press conference he basically came out with some garbage yeah. well i don't know anything about that black hole talking <laughs> excuse me like, just uh, just a just a complete you you should have said no comment my man like he completely I hate got, no comment he complete- as, a, as a statement but you should have just said no comment but you you ask every single person players if they're still in the league i think only a handful of them are still in the league you ask them you talk to coaches you talk to traders you talk to the front office you talk to every single person that was in that organization in 2010 and, they and if they if they knew about it if they were complicit in any way there should be consequences 100 percent. and we're not even haven't even really talked about brad aldrich i don't think there's much to say about that guy other than he needs to go to prison um yeah one last thing and, i want uh, he that's the other thing that gets me as well is that like so he left the the blackhawks very suddenly which is not suspicious at all after this came out um he went on to work at uh, miami university in ohio he was there for four months again left very suddenly no one really knows why and goes from being the video coach to the stanley cup winning team and is suddenly teaching at a high school in Michigan where he would then go on to assault a teenager, a minor. And again, like that is, that is on Stan Bowman's conscience. That is on this organization's conscience. And I, again, going back to it, I don't know how, I don't know how you live with yourself knowing that you gave someone that you knew this person was a sexual predator, first of all, you didn't do anything about it. Not only did you not do anything about it, you gave him a positive reference to go and work with children. Yeah. How do you how do you look at yourself in the mirror after that? How do you how do you tell yourself that you're a good person? Like that's like I, I generally think of myself as as a pretty good person. You know, like I I am an asshole sometimes. I think we all are, but how do you how do you look so at yourself in the mirror and like what you see? when that the clippers live to fight another day here's what our local experts are locked on today 
The LA Clippers defeat the Phoenix Suns 116 to 102 in game 5 to stay alive in their series which now stands at 3-2 in favor of the Suns. Our local experts in Los Angeles, Chuck Mockler and William Updike, called it Paul George's best playoff performance ever. Listen to that today on Locked On Clippers. The defending champion Tampa Bay Lightning won Game 1 of the Stanley Cup Finals 5-1 over the Montreal Canadiens. Today on Locked On Canadiens, the major defensive adjustments that must be made to keep them in the series. Are Damian Lillard's days in Portland numbered? The answer is on the Locked On Today podcast. All the sports news you need in under 20 minutes. Follow Locked On Today, today, wherever you get podcasts. Local experts on the biggest stories. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.